Few have thrilled this view of the world's greatest racing spectacle, the place, the 500-mile speedway in Indianapolis, the event, the 43rd running of the 500-mile classic. This is the scene, May 30th, 1959. Nearly a quarter of a million spectators on hand. However, before the big day ever arrives, there's a full year of planning and hard work. It's called Gasoline Alley. This is the speedway home in May for the expensive speed creations, drivers, mechanics, car owners, and race officials. Here are the decisions that will bring victory for one driver, one car, one crew are made. This is the mechanical heart of the speedway. Now look at a foreign entry. From Italy comes the El Dorado Special. It's power plant, a Maserati engine. This car raced last year at Monza, Italy. Foreign entries certainly lend to the international flavor of the 500. Here in Gasoline Alley, you'll learn of the ambitions of the men whose experiments have resulted in many refinements embodied on our modern passenger cars. To them, we owe not only the thrills of racing, but also the accomplishment of many improvements we take for granted every time we get behind the wheel. First day of qualifying, wind is high. In practice, Tony Buttenhausen got upside down on the backstretch. Governor Harold Hanley of Indiana takes an unfamiliar seat in the Bryant Heating and Cooling Special. Car number 19 is one of 61 cars entered. Before the 1959 entries go to work, an old timer has a chance for one last bit of glory. This is old number 10, and this creation finished second of the 1910 race when it was but 250 miles in length. Now let's pick up speed. Dwayne Carter, considered the old pro of racing, comes out of retirement to continue a career in racing that spans 27 years. Carter is first on the track to qualify, first to post a speed on this 10-mile run, four times around this two-and-a-half-mile brick and asphalt oval. Despite his layoff of almost four years, Carter blazes to an average speed of almost 143 miles an hour. From Pennsylvania comes the Flying Scott. It's little Johnny Thompson. Thompson lets everyone know he's out to post the fastest time of the first day and earn the right to sit on the inside of the first row on race day. The familiar pole position. His right foot down hard, and will he make it? And the timer. Here's the thrilling news. He's in with an amazing 146-mile-an-hour average. A new Speedway four-lap record. Tony Bettenhausen returns to the pit area, and he's telling announcer Chuck Bailey he's unhurt, looking for another car. Next out, personable Roger Ward in a brand new creation, his first time at the track. Carrying number five, it's the leader card 500 Roadster. It's been put in perfect racing condition by its builder, A.J. Watson, one of the most successful master mechanics ever to put an entry on the track. Ward is gunning for a position up front in the starting field, and he's in that racing groove. The checkered flag is out, and Ward is in the field. This likable Speedway veteran gives an outstanding qualifying performance with a mark of over 144 miles an hour. This early pace causes some mechanics to give the yellow flag to their chauffeurs. This means try harder on the next attempt. Some drivers aren't too happy with the way things are working out. Take Paul Russo, for instance. Not content with his driving record in 12 previous classics, he's plenty worried about getting into this one. Just plain hot and unhappy. Rabid race fans desire to do their own timing. Two stopwatches and a time chart, the necessary tool. Eddie Johnson in the Bryant Heating and Cooling Special, an Indianapolis entry, says he feels perfect. Chief mechanic on the Bryant entry, Joe Scopa and Johnson, are very happy with a speed of exactly 144 miles an hour. Fourteen cars qualified the first weekend, and during the next week, there was plenty of work to be done on those cars that did not qualify. Here's one crew hard at it. Work? Yes, but there's always time for recreation. J.C. Agajanian, car owner, turns starter but for a different type of race. Roger Ward leads the pack. Whoops, Phil's here, too. Promising Speedway rookie Chuck Arnold will be in number 71. Beginning of the second weekend of qualification attempts. Veteran Speedway officials include Dr. C.B. Boner, track physician, Al Speedway. And the fans are never too young. 
Out to qualify on the second weekend is Johnny Dolan in car number 43, the Chapman Special. He starts through the south straightaway on the fourth lap. Trouble, real trouble. He keeps hitting that wall. Tolan finally rolls to a stop. Is Tolan injured? That's the big question. Emergency crews hurry to the scene. Tolan climbs out apparently okay. A true race driver. His first thought is this of his machine. Will it race again? Part of the skid marks of his 1,100-foot slide. Speedway racing director, Sam Hanks, at the scene. And now here's the rare sight. Somebody forgot to latch the hook. This is a mechanical problem for sure. But it's one, incidentally, that the track crew can handle. Track open for practice. It's Earl Motter. The Oval is open for qualification, and veteran Paul Russo is out at number 45 for his second attempt. And Russo, this time, checks in at just the tick of the watch, under 142 and a half miles an hour, and he's in the starting field of 33. The night before the race comes the climax of the four-day 500 festival, the fabulous 500 festival parade. In a gay holiday mood, hundreds of thousands of spectators line downtown Indianapolis streets to cheer the lavish parade floats and fast-stepping marching units. For two hours, the colorful procession rolls past the reviewing stands, formal-clad queens, bright uniformed marchers, shapely drum majorettes, and lots of movie stars. They're all here. The entry of the city of Indianapolis, thus extending a royal welcome, expressed in this float to the city's visitors. Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr. of the television series 77 Sunset Strip. Another guest is Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, and this floats in his honor. Festival Queen Anne Laurie of Indianapolis and members of her court. The Indianapolis Power and Light Company had one of the outstanding entries one that drew cheers of praise all along the parade route. The Allison Division of General Motors with its entry. one lending a touch of comedy. And still they come, all part of an annual event that grows in interest and extravagance with each and every year. And here's one of unusual design and beauty, entered by the 7-Up Company. All critics agree, the finest festival parade in history. Race day is here. Outside the gates, cars from every one of our 50 states and several foreign nations are arriving. A few fans have seen every one of the 42 previous races. Others are regulars of recent years and still others here for the first time. Once inside, drivers have a race of their own. They want those first row in field positions. Some have waited outside the track for days just for that chance. It's early morning, and yet thousands and thousands are already here and moving to where they want to see the race. Activity quickens. Cars are pulled from Gasoline Alley to the pit area. Former winner Pat Flaherty will be in number 64. Pat won this race in 1956. Jack Turner and his green helmet will be in number 24. Number 16 has one of the favorites, Jim Rathman. The only mechanical marvels are not on the track. There are some experts among the spectators, too. All that's missing here is an elevator. From a tower on the southwest turn, this is how it looks. Say, could this be Coney Island? 
Driver Jack Turner. Driver Eddie Johnson. And you might have expected it. The traditional Speedway Rabbit turns out. Ah, but he's ruled off the course. This bunny failed to qualify. Hollywood starlet Aaron O'Brien is here to kiss the winner in victory lane after the race. Speedway President Tony Hallman and Governor Stratton of Illinois, Governor Hanley of Indiana. The celebrated Golden Girl leads the Purdue University All-American Band. The 33 machines are pushed up the track to their respective starting positions. In the front row, it will be Johnny Thompson, Eddie Sachs, and Jim Rathman. Apparently calm, but inwardly nervous, drivers are getting set to go. Here's last year's winner, Jimmy Bryan. He'll be in number six. Bob Vice in the John Zink special. From Florida comes Dal Keller in the healthy special, and Al starts from spot number 27. Tony Bettenhausen, that has been in every race since 1946. Every car now in position as the traditional balloons are released. There's an ominous sky overhead. It looks mighty like rain. Will the Speedway's weather luck hold out? Tony Holman ready with gentlemen, start your engines. Up the line, mechanics indicate their engines are started. The pace car takes off. Driven by Sam Hanks, this is the traditional start of many years, 11 rows of three. This start resumes after a two-year lap. As the mechanics push their creations off, go their hopes and dreams of the past year's work. And now it's up to one man, the driver. And mechanics hurry out of traffic and they're getting back over the wall with their starters in record time. And the first of two pace laps get underway. From here on, every turn is to the left. All the cars are moving. Hold on. Defending champ Jimmy Bryan is having trouble. His crew is still pushing him down the track. Apparently, Bryan can't disengage his clutch. And will he get in this race? Now they gather in the southwest turn behind the pace car. First two, first three rows set now. Field begins to catch up. Brian still now in the pit area, still trying to start him. Here's the first of the two pace laps being completed. The crew still working on Jimmy Bryan. Has he got a chance? The field now gathers in that first turn. A beautiful sight as the cars move in behind the pace car. Still working on Jimmy Bryan's car. Now in the third turn. Excitement galore. The start just a few seconds away now. And the pace car pulls off and the race is on. Say, that probably is the most perfect start in all Speedway history. Johnny Thompson into the turn first in car number three, with Rathman and Ward right on his tail. All cars safely through that first turn. Thompson in turn number three holds onto that lead. The field begins to string out now behind the leaders. And here he comes, Thompson, completing lap number one. And Thompson leads like quite a margin. He's really pouring it on. Each lap carries with it a prize of $150 to the leading car. Thompson's car is performing perfectly, and Johnny knows the right combination. The theory of winning this race is to get out in front and stay there, like Thompson in car number three. And that's just what he intends to do. With plenty of racing room in front of him in the early going, he's pouring it on. Back of the first three, the field is pretty well punched up. There's a lot of traffic to fight back there. And notice that Thompson is increasing his lead with each lap. And he's out to leave them all behind. But there's Brian. He's back out there now, but hold on. He's having trouble. Smoke still pouring out of that car. 
He's having plenty of trouble. Already three laps behind. Brian's car just is not going to be able to make it and back into the pit area. Roger Ward makes his bid for the lead. Trouble in the first turn. That's Eddie Sachs. Look out. Somebody's going to hit him. Bobby Grimm squeezes by high. Bettenhausen low. Sachs rebounds from the wall. It's unbelievable. They all missed him. Ward passes Thompson in his taken command. Car number five out in front now. Roger Ward leading for the first time in the race. Johnny Thompson is second. Eddie Sachs getting a tow to start his engine, and he's getting back in this race. It's lap number eight now. Ward still leading. Eddie Sachs comes into the pit area. Racing rules require him to pit the first time around after an accident. Eddie's lost his chance of winning, but he's still hoping to finish up among the leaders. A complete change of four tires required. Here's Ward holding onto that lead. Johnny Thompson right after him. Jim Rathman in number three position. Eddie Sachs gets out there after a 26-second pit stop, but there are a lot of miles to make up for Eddie Sachs. Ward and Thompson, cars number five and number three, still battling for the lead. Ward has that slight edge. And staying right up front is Jim Rathman at lap number 13. And Jim has the combination now. Trouble! Len Sutton in the walk at special. Nobody gets involved so far. Sutton climbs out. He's okay. Here's the front runner, Johnny Thompson, coming into the pit for his first stop. Excitement mounts in the pit area. All eyes now on the crew of the brand new car number three. It's lap 36. Every second counts. Fuel and a change of three tires required. Thompson has already been in the lead four laps. All is set. And Thompson moves out in just 25 seconds. Starting position out of nowhere comes Pat Flaherty to chase Rathman. Looking to the northeast turn, back in the pack. Chuck Wyant spins, hits the wall, a car catapults over him. It lands upside down. Look, the racer has tire traction even when upside down. It's on fire, finally gets to the infield. Who is it? It's car number 77, and driver Mike McGill gets that fire out. McGill is still in there. Fellow drivers Judd Larson and Red Amy, who spun to avoid the pileup, help push the machine upright. This is the Northeast Turn, scene of last year's spectacular series of crashes. And that fire is out now. The green light is on, and Pat Flaherty takes the lead. The 1956 winner hasn't been here since that victory. Due to injury, and he's out to prove the layoff didn't affect his driving capability. There he is, leading Rathman, and here's the new electric scoreboard, designed so that spectators throughout a large area can follow the leaders in the race. It's controlled from the timing and scoring section in the control tower. It's lap 92. Pat Flaherty in for his second pit stop. In for fuel and a change of three tires. What a race he's driving. That duel he had with Rathman was one of the greatest wheel-to-wheel -wheel duels ever seen here. Wait, Flaherty's in trouble. Now, apparently, he's broken his second gear and it may force him out of competition. Pat frantically working to get that machine moving. Finally out there, but a loss of important seconds to the leaders. More excitement in the north, he turns, Crawford hits the wall, Ray's car catches fire. Look what happened. You'll never see that again. The fire puts itself out. Despite gasoline all over the track, that fire is out. 
As Crawford is in trouble at the same spot as McGill, word comes that Mike McGill will be okay. That roll bar undoubtedly saving. Jim Rathman in the Simon Ice Special hurries into the pit. Notice the use of air jacks. Six of the cars in this race have air jacks welded to the frame. This system uses compressed nitrogen to raise the car for wheel changing by means of steel legs that descend from the chassis. It's designed to save precious seconds, and it's remarkably successful. It's lap 149 with Ward still hanging on to a five-second lead. Brassman back on the track there, and he knows he's got his work cut out for him. A fire in the pit. It's Dick Rathman. Rathman gets out of there. His fire repellent uniform saves him undoubtedly from serious burns. All mechanics and drivers are required to wear fire repellent clothes. But the car, well, it's out of the race due to this unfortunate fire. And this fire is a real stubborn one. Rathman has shed his uniform just to make certain, but no burns there. Car number 73, now out of the race, and so is Dick Rathman. Hey, Dick, don't forget that helmet. How's this for a scorekeeper deluxe? This Speedway buff in the infield is really equipped. Say, hey, bud, how's number 19, the Bryan machine, doing? This is lap 150, and this fellow has Ward in first, Thompson second, Jim Rathman in third, and Bettenhaus in fourth. And what's more, he's right. But what if one of those watches should quit? Johnny Boyd at the Bose Field Pass Special, running six as he stops for the last time. Boyd has been plagued with engine trouble from the drop of the green flag and is making up as much difference as he can in the corners. His engine is running about 700 RPM shy going down the straightaway. 24 seconds in, and he's out. Someone spinning like a top. It's Pat Flaherty. He keeps hitting the wall. Now he stops in front of the pit entrance. Ward is due to come in. He threads the needle. Ward squeezes in there. Pat Flaherty is climbing out now. Man, he's had it. No injury, just plain worn out after hitting the wall seven times. With the caution flag out, other drivers are taking advantage and stopping. Tony Bettenhausen riding in fourth still has a chance to move up on the leaders. Dwayne Carter gets the 140 mile an hour sign from his crew. Bettenhausen back out there in 22 seconds. Quick work by his crew. The latest in Speedway fashion. We've noticed the use of air jacks and what terrific time savers. Here's another innovation, a platform jack. Paul Russo on the Bardall Special just rolls up and bingo, the platform jack is activated. This is a record pit stop. Three tires changed in just 18 seconds. A bit of relaxation is necessary now and then for some, and they're all part of the largest crowd in the history of the race. All eyes on Roger Ward's final pit stop. As Ward comes in, he's just 53 seconds in the lead, less than a lap ahead of Rathman, who's already made his last stop. Three tires and fuel in 28 seconds, and that quick work there could mean the race. Ward back out there, his lead cut to 26 seconds. But for him, the important thing is he's out in front, and Rathman's got to catch him. Ward's three stops average just 24 seconds. For Ward, just 31 laps to the finish. Position number one is flashed to him by his crew. For Ward's crew, these are mighty anxious moments. Jim Rathman still hanging in there, hoping for a break and standing on it hard. 199 laps complete, white flag out now. Just one more lap and Ward will be a first time champion. The checkered flag is out. Ward wins his victory. It is all the sweeter for its lack of advanced fanfare. Most fans thought it would be Thompson, Jim Rathman, or Brian. Always a great driver. Ward hasn't had the racing luck until today. Ward is headed for the richest payoff 
in Speedway history. Into victory lane he goes, and the celebration begins. Greeted first by car owner Bob Wilkie, Starlight Aaron O'Brien, and the trophy, and Ward's lovely wife. A great deal of acclaim must also go to A.J. Watson, who built the car with its stand-up engine. Contrary to the design of the winning car the past two years, which had a layover engine. While Ward is in for the celebration, Jim Rathman finishes second, just 23 seconds behind Roger. Thompson is third, Bettenhausen fourth, Paul Goldsmith fifth. That's the first five. The second five in order, Johnny Boyd, Carter, Johnson and the Bryant special, Paul Russo and A.J. Foyt. Champions all. Ward is telling everyone, every time I needed a little bit more today, I had it. Ward picks up almost $110,000 of a record $340,000 purse, the richest ever. His speed, another new record, 135.857 miles an hour. Certainly, this is the fastest, richest 500. Roger Ward, a real gentleman, wins the spectacular 500.